Welcome to another session of the Exadata Aston Office Hours. Today, our guest experts are Krish Telikicharla and his team, who are responsible, among other things, for the Oracle Exadata Deployment Assistant, OEDA, and more broadly for putting together the entire stack that comprises a full configured deployed Exadata. So, hi everyone, my name is Krishna. Um, and on the phone or on Zoom here, I have with me Phil, Rene, and Chandra. And we're part of the uh, Exadata Imaging and OEDA team. And we respin Oracle Linux to make the foundation of Exadata. And we also build the configuration and deployment tool, the OEDA utility that customers use to configure and deploy Exadata. Along with that, we also have a uh, upgrade utility that will do image upgrades. And as part of the OEDA entire infrastructure, we also deal with a lifecycle management of Exadata, basically cluster-wide database and upgrades, downgrades of that as well. And also database management and some cloud management. So at a high level, that's that's what the whole, what we all do. And Rene does a bunch of upgrade downgrade. Phil does a bunch of uh, lifecycle management and discovery. Chandra does lifecycle management and a whole bunch of deployment stuff. We wanted to talk about what challenges we face, what we're going to do forward, and what we've learned from our unique perspective of looking at a few thousand customer cases that show up and what we've learned building engineered systems. Chris, you're, you're being a little humble. This team that you run are at the core of, of what our engineered system idea is all about. A standardized deployment across every single customer to make sure that we reduce risk, we reduce variance. We know the product that we have out there and we can talk to, this is exactly why you're seeing the performance benefits that you're seeing. It's because we are standardizing and we're taking best practices. And Chris's team are the drivers behind a lot of that and the, the actual implementation of that. It's just the work that I see your team doing through the last couple of iterations and what you went through with the Rocky um, implementation and even just more recently, Secure Fabric. Because, you know, just to reiterate, we run Exadata internally a lot. We have a lot of our database development teams run on Exadata, obviously a whole Exadata engineering team have, um, you know, many, many Exadatas around there. And so to test new features, to test what our software development teams are working on, they need an install. And that's also a crucial team, making sure that we use things like OEDA to get those new features in and to get them up and running for a whole engineering team, not just our, our customers. So a current, you know, out in the field solution that we're running and maintaining and, and ensuring is is up to date with the latest best practices, but also that you know forward facing internal development environment. So one of the challenges that's happened actually in the last few years is initially the image used to be something that we just that we would do as an afterthought. Whereas in the last few years we've come to realize that both the image and deployment is not just for external cases. And so we now have an entire fleet that does nightly regression of the entire suite and trying to balance and manage and get firmware, software, hardware, everything together daily to work is an interesting challenge. Krish, why don't you zoom out a little bit, contrast the kind of work that you do with the kind of work that a pure software release organization does maybe frame it in terms that people who don't know hardware true uh you know interesting because interesting question because it was only about uh five six years ago when we began to you know i think we all jumped into exadata as going yeah we can do this thing and then slowly we realized that most software projects have a layer of abstracting out hardware and so even if we're doing database development to a large extent abstracted out hardware and we can simulate disk with you know a file somewhere whereas with the image and deployment of an engineered system we're so close to the hardware that there is no way to abstract it out because we're dealing with new disk new firmware new cpu new memory and a new entire chassis actually and so the challenge when we do that is Whatever you do takes an inordinate amount of time and resources. 
and the test cycles get longer and longer. And oftentimes I'm asked this question going, why is that so hard, man? You guys, you know, I have Apple shipping a million phones and they have, uh, you know, we have iPhones and we have Androids and we do all of this together and we don't have any issues there, right? We have other people doing this. And I, one of the answers I ended up having to come up with was, you know, Android and iPhones, they do one device. Uh, whereas what we're doing is an engineered system is at its smallest level is uh, two computes and three storage cells, two InfiniBand switches or Rocky switches and a admin switch and an entire network infrastructure. So typically our runtime is not one iPhone or one Android, but typically about seven of them from different manufacturers and different assembly and completely different ecosystems. We're trying to put them all together and make sure they all, they all leave the factory as a cohesive unit that a customer can go and press a button and you have a working database that has all of our best practices uh, baked in. And it's been an interesting challenge and it seems to get more and more challenging every day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so having said that, we're trying to get people on a well-trodden path so that everybody has a successful deployment and everybody gets best practices with the fastest uh, IO bandwidth and seamless upgrades. So just to dig in on that, you, you mentioned best practices. So um, there's Exacheck and it's got its own little ecosystem there and based on best practices from MAA team, what is coming back through bug fixes, how do you take what is coming in from an exit check from a, the actual ecosystem that is running to then turn around and put it into ODA? But is it something that you can do? It's a good question. Yes, uh, it is what we do. And over the years we've learned and now we have this system and it's sort of a, we've learned it organically. We now have a funnel where we have a weekly meeting for best practices, which is fed by both in-house testing, customer testing, field issues. Everybody talks about it and they get implemented as best practices and it gets in the code, in Exacheck, in databases, in the images, everywhere. And we try to turn everything around in a month. Whenever anything shows up, we try and get best practices and fixes every month. I think we do a pretty good job considering the vastness of this entire uh, universe. So when an exit check thing shows up, like as recently as a few weeks ago, there was a thing about on, on one guest during an upgrade, there's a VM num free K bytes is a little different. And so we were altering it in this release uh, and it turns around usually in a, in a month. I suppose the, the life cycle there is a bug comes in or, a, a, you know, one of our um, engineers sees an issue. It goes through that whole exit check cycle to, to get in there. And if it's something that we want to have as a standard going forward for all of our customers. So it's not just one-offs. It's not just customers done one particular scenario. It, it's got to apply across everything. And that's where it ends up in OEDA. Yeah, so, yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's actually a a pretty vast amount of rigor that goes into each of these things to what a best practice or a utility or a setting or a parameter comes in. There's various tests, various groups that get involved, there's performance testing, you know, scalability, availability. All of those are vetted before. It's almost like a, there's a large committee. And I am always surprised at how quickly things move through that committee. Sometimes not so fast, but usually pretty good. Yeah, and, and I think we just learned over time, over many years, I think. And we've also learned how to identify issues that are more critical versus not so critical. Yeah. Do you have got an example for us without naming names? An example for us? Well, for example, security issues go to the top of the list, and which is a big challenge with cloud and security. Is that, uh, we've learned that usually a few years ago, we were a little lax on security or a little less aware, I should say. Yeah, and now a moment a security issue shows up, it, it promptly gets to the head of the class. So, yeah, you've got that ongoing P 
piece that's coming in through this channel and filtering into OEDA, but you've also got new technologies coming in and new and enhancements that are happening constantly within the software team. Can you just pick on Secure Fabric? It came in 20.1, so it's very recent. Is a change to the, um, the networking piece? Okay. And from a, a PM perspective, we're saying, you don't have to worry about it, Mr. Customer. It's just done automatically. Well, you're the automatic. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's OEDA that implements the automatic piece that we talk about being automatic. Sure. Uh, secure Fabric uh, is basically security at the private interconnect layer on Rocky networks, on the uh, RDMA or converged right. Ethernet networks for the private net. And to a certain extent, it's very, very invasive. It is all over. It is on the Rocky switch. It's on the KVM host. It's on the storage cell. It's on the KVM guest. And it requires a tremendous amount of hand-holding and plumbing to get it all aligned and for it to work. If even one net mask, IP, cable, port number, anything is out of whack and the whole thing doesn't work, which, which is what you want, really, because it needs to be secure. It took us a few months to get the whole thing working. And we're now, I'm always amazed when I look at it and go, yeah, you know, right now, from a customer perspective, all that they have to do is provide one single VLAN ID and one VLAN for a cluster and one VLAN for a storage network. And you press a button and the entire infrastructure just falls into place and you have a secure cluster. And this works on initial deployment, and we take care of upgrades and rollback and multiple clusters, and we pretty much eat our own dog food in our cloud now. Uh, <laughs> so it's there. Yeah, yeah. Rene, Kevin, you? like Chris was just telling about all the time it goes in to validate and the, the best practices that come in and all that. And I, I think we should also tell a little bit more about those best practices because all these validations we do for all those different permutations of like hardware and software, the biggest benefit of Exadata is that what we know, we validate for our customers, right? And there was many customers that still try to make a lot of changes. Most of them are allowed, uh, but there was like a couple of drastic changes that people now then try to do, which we are trying to say, okay, what you want to do uh, might be possible, but it might also be possible that it's not validated by us. And you better stay within what we have been validating over the years. And, yeah. and even if it's good feedback that we receive from the field or request, then of course we can take it and we can evaluate it. And then we can make it part of our image, which then in the end will be validated again and vetted by everyone and can then become part of the image so everyone benefits. So that's something I really like to highlight. Yeah, no, it's like it, it does make sense. Yeah, that's exactly right, yeah. Renee. And um, just thinking of an, an example in my own world, the DBA a very long time ago, an OFA came out. So the naming convention of where you're going to put your Oracle homes. And that seems so long ago now, I know. But it's something that, you know, you get three DBAs, you get four opinions. So people are very particular about their environments. And then all of a sudden you've got Oracle coming in with Exadata saying, no, no, you should do it this way. And I say, well, yeah, but we've always done it this way. Yes, but we really recommend you should do this because it's based on, as you said, Renee, it's best practice. It's, we've tested it, we've verified, we've validated. This is what we think you should be doing. And we allow people to, to go that way. And it's like, okay, we'll support you as best we can, but we haven't tested that. That's not our best practice. And you know, push a certain direction, but allow our customers to go a bit off the rails, maybe. I'd like to turn around that issue of the best practice a little more. Tell us a little bit about what you call a best practice, what becomes best practice, what's the authority for that, and how you promulgate and how you enforce that, and how it evolves, how it changes. Let me give you like a real nice example about what is a best practice. First, let me, let me find the, the, the problem that Exadata has to be solving. So for years and years, that is still the case in, in all enterprise businesses with everyone running Linux. When they want to do like a major Linux upgrade, from Linux 6 to Linux 7, or from Linux 5 to Linux 6. They give you like, a, like the fresh DVD, and they say, good luck, wipe the image, reinstall everything, and reconfigure everything. That is what's happening today, everywhere in the world. So for Exadata, we have this unique thing created for our customers, 
where we actually help them to do that upgrade without the re-image. Because Exadata has said, okay, we recognize the problem and just re-imaging a database node, running your database, is just a no-go. And like our team and our groups have been investing in that heavily to make that possible. And that is truly a unique thing we provide. It is a lot of benefit. And then we do a lot of validations to do that. Many validations to see how is this working and what if we do this, does it still work? But obviously, the framework within can do all these tests, that is limited. So meaning that if you have like too weird of a customization that we didn't think of, it yeah. can break. And right. that is, for example, the thing. Yeah. If I you do. like go with like, I'll go ahead. I was going to say, do you have some examples of those customizations where, uh, as Chris would put it, you know, that we don't particularly like? Right. So, so for example, if, if you decide for this upgrade to have put one of your critical file systems, like a, that an operating system expects to be there, if you decide to make that a different file system, one of those direct, for example, as a lib or something like that, if you decide to say, oh, this is our best practice to make that a different file system, and that, that might be something that is like not expected. Because today it is, because I'm mentioning it. So then we add it. But those kind of things, you're like making your own file system customizations or installing libraries, yeah, packages we're not expecting at that point. The, the fact that I'm mentioning those things right now is obviously not that like now, today, me mentioning it means it's addressed now. But over the years, the lesson learned is that those things can always break things. So thinking about Exadata, when people buy it, just an on-premises Exadata, so the customer owns the machine. We are not managing it. It's not a cloud thing. What you are describing sounds like you have to account for the fact that although Exadata is integrated and engineered and tuned, there are a lot of things that the customers may have done that when they need to upgrade, may fall out of these practices, right? right. And, and you know, Exacheck, of course, plays a role in this. Yeah, so I think what Rene was saying that we've come up with these best practices. So, for example, we've learned that if you make drastic modifications to file systems, it is hard for us to upgrade and ensure reliability. So now we add checks before we do the upgrade. The same way for custom packages that will break dependencies when and if you do upgrade, because we don't want a critical database system to be upgraded from, let's say, OL5 to OL6 and then not work. We would much rather stop beforehand and say, hey, I cannot upgrade this now because if I do, it is not going to continue working, We're going to lose business. But unfortunately, we learned that over time because we're unable to be as creative as everybody together. Yeah, and I suppose we also need to tread a fine line of what we think is best and actual use cases and customer environments. Yep. There's customers that are using particular backup agents that need to install. So it's treading a fine line, I suppose, between making sure that we've got the system that we have and the patching, the upgrades, the continuation of the product is safe and secure and we know that we can get to five nines. But then there's the customer needs to back up. We don't want to stop that. We want to allow our customer to do backups they need, the integration they need. You guys are kind of right in the middle of both of those yeah, it is that fine line of what is acceptable risk. And we have this quadrant of this low value, high value, low risk and high risk. Right. And we try to get all four quadrants except for the low value, high risk quadrant. That makes sense. <laughs> I like the description of the quadrants very much. That provides a structure to make decisions and to explain why we do things, right? Yep. Uh, yeah. But the one thing I wanted to tell you, there are also many people who want to install all kinds of applications on the database node, right? But the, if you want to do that, then maybe if there is an option to run your apps in a Docker environment, because those custom apps, they might just be conflicting with the existing image. And by separating them out in a Docker environment, they are not uh, conflicting with the image anymore. I also still want to mention something we didn't mention. There is a there is a difference between the cells and the DB nodes, right? So when we're talking about allowing uh, customizations and all that within reasonable guidelines, that is only applicable to database nodes. Yeah. Right, the storage nodes and, are completely buttoned down. Right. 
But we still try to do all the work on the DB nodes to refer to that iPhone example again. For example, when you do this, this massive upgrade from Linux 6 to Linux 7, and for some reason, your customization has failed in the upgrade, then we still try to look at that iPhone principle. We say, okay, we're just going to roll the whole thing back automatically, and you'll be back at the start. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So to add one thing about the Docker container, we've had this request to try and to run applications on compute nodes for many years. And uh, many years ago, we even though there was spare CPU on the compute nodes for some customers, the general consensus was that the compute node is designed for database workload, and it's kind of expensive real estate to stick an application on it. Yeah. So you'd be much better off running the application well, somewhere. Well, that goes back to my question earlier when I was saying machine belongs to the customer. Naturally, right. the customer comes up with things that they want to do because they pay money for it and it's plugged into their power and their network, right? So the comment about Docker and running applications on the same nodes leads, I think, naturally to the broader question of what role you play in the maintaining and strengthening the, the security. So yeah, but that's sort of a customer issue. I can tell you what we do on our side as far as making sure that the product is secure when it ships. And over the last few years, we've we run, you know, I think right now we've got a new one, but we run uh, Stig, Qualys, Nessus, scans on all of them. And our, for, for a couple of years, we had it secure, but we didn't keep an eye on the score in, in the sense that we thought we were complying and we were doing better than the Stig requirements, except that the score didn't match up because the stick itself was trailing our changes. And we realized that that was not passing the government regulatory agencies who said, no, we need the stick score, man. I don't care if it's more secure. <laughs> so we now have to do both. And so I'm actually very proud that our stick score is almost 90% for both computes and cells and guests. To the point where if you make it any more secure, if you go over that 90, 92%, the hosts become unusable, meaning you can't log in. It will, you know, <laughs> so another example of your, of your quadrants, right? Yeah, because that you can't log in in the sense that over 92, they require passwords to be rotated weekly, password to be 37 characters with various things that you just can't do anything. Uh, you will close all ports, databases won't run, things like that. And yeah, so that score is out of the factory. So that's before any kind of hardening best practice that we have for the yeah. customers. So that's straight out of the factory. I did see that the other day. I was pretty impressed. Yeah, and, and I think we started this conversation in the middle, right? Because we've been talking about what happens with upgrades. But the truth is, you are also delivering the fresh things from scratch, which is just as exciting. It is not any easier, right? In, in some sense, it's even harder. So tell us a little bit about the contrast I understand the upgrades are, are in some sense gnarly and maybe something people experience, but tell us, tell us more about the so, brand new machines. So this is something we learned a few years ago that when we went from OL5, OL6, and then OL7, we learned that every major release that we went through kept getting a little fatter. Just like all software that people write over the years, your Thunderbird starts at a 20 meg download, and a few years later, it's 150 meg download. And we noticed the same thing uh, happening with Linux as well. And by, and by me, I mean one guy, Cody. So we went back to the Linux team and went and figured out a way to go and get our own kernel that was at the root of this fattening of Linux. And we go and figure out a way to make it better. Uh, reduce our security footprint, basically reduce our attack surface, making the image smaller, making our security score go up, making upgrades faster, downloads faster, less junk services come up. We don't have things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and all kinds of stuff in the in an enterprise kernel. I can't have Bluetooth on my Exadata, do tell. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's not calling home. Yeah, so all of those we've learned over time, and it's right now a critical component. So those are all the things that we do before. Sorry, that's the UEK Nano you're referring to, isn't it? The yeah, is um, lightweight yeah. version of the UEK Nano. By the way, as a side effect of the comment, it becomes apparent that you are not just taking components off the shelf. You are 
pushing back changes to the components to adapt to what you need. That's an interesting problem, right? Because you want to stay in the mainstream so you don't have to reinvent everything, but you also don't want to take all that people are adding for the general purpose cases, right? How does it work with other things besides Linux? Initially, it was very hard, but now we have it for the most part down. We have the whole process down to where we get the kernel, we get firmware drivers built. Oh, the other thing we did for security is we sign all packages. Everything gets signed with a secure boot. So right now, that process works pretty well. We get the nano kernel built and we get all the packages we want signed as well, and they're all compatible. We work very closely with both upstream Linux and the Oracle Linux team here. And so one thing I like about the way you guys describe your work is that you say, we learn, we have been learning, we learn, we learn, we learn. You want to tell us some anecdote, something that was a learning experience that made you think that, oh, you know, we really have to pay attention to all kinds of weird things here. Well, I'm humbled all the time because I don't think we've ever gotten fully a grasp of the whole problem. Secure boot was an interesting problem an interesting challenge because we had this mandate that said, you know, we need secure boot and to make sure everything is signed in Linux in the image because it needs to be secure by default. And to get it done was is and was initially was very hard to wrap our heads around it because it was one of those things going, why would I do this to myself? The moment I do secure boot, I need to get every single thing signed Otherwise, it won't even image. I don't have a host. And interestingly, the, and we resisted for many months, but there was customer pressures, customers wanted it. And so we had to go and get everything signed. And it took many months to get them all lined up, to get the grub, the kernel, the shim, packages, Pixie boot, TFTP boot, and to also figure out how upgrades work when you go from a non-secure boot to a secure boot environment. I don't know if that answers your question, Chris. Yes, of course. Uh, we seem to have an uncharacteristically shy audience today. That's why I keep asking questions. But of course, please, those of you in the audience, do ask your questions. We did get a very open-ended general question at the beginning that maybe Gavin, we could entertain now. Yeah, just before we go there, just wanted to touch on that secure boot thing. You talked about what that entailed and what that means for you, but I just wanted to set the context for for people listening and and watching that on the back end of what you come up with, there is a factory and that factory is churning out racks of exadata and they're using your image to do that. So any change that you make, you need to keep them in mind to make sure that you're not breaking the process for them. So even your security checks and your numbering, you've got to keep the factory churning. From a product management point of view, we can't let you stop the factory. The worst thing that you can hear as a product manager is, you know, we've stopped shipping. Oh, you can't do that. So you've got that whole back-end process relying on every month the, the factory pick up a new release to install, test, and ship hundreds of racks. Okay, That's right. That's right. The whole thing. So that's... That's just some, you know, just a a little bit of pressure for those people to make sure that that's still good. Any other questions? There was a question early, very early on. The first question at the top, I think, Gavin, was the, what is the difference between Exadata and Exadata to the customer? Yes. Yeah, so, well, just from a product perspective, obviously, Exadata is the core platform. It is the underlying hardware. It's the, the platform that runs the Oracle database. Exadata Cloud at Customer is our cloud version of that that can run in the customer's premises, but as the Oracle Cloud. And, you know, if you go to oracle.com slash Exadata, I'm sure you'll get directed to exactly what the three different services we have are about. But from an installation point of view, Krish, here we go. You do XSCC as well, don't you? The the installer for XSCC is actually the same OEDA. OEDA, yeah. It's the same image and OEDA for Exadata Cloud at Customer. Yes. So now all of a sudden, apart from requirements coming in from our customers in the field and security and best practices and MAA, you now have requirements coming in from cloud, yeah? Yes. We have two flavors of cloud. We have an on-premise cloud, meaning the Exadata cloud service, and we have a clouded customer. And so we have the same image, same deployment that 
occurs on both. So how has the inclusion of that Exadata has been around 12 years now? ExaCC and ExaCS has been the last, what, four years? Four years, um, yeah. The integration of that and the additional requirements coming in from that, was it a difficult add? Was it just an add on top? Because I know there's a lot of other software teams working on top of what you're providing, but yeah. how's that? So funnily enough, actually, that's a humbling experience because when we did the image and we did OEDA and then we jumped off the cliff of lifecycle management for the cloud. Because when we started doing cloud service and we have the infrastructure, we now have to do <clears throat> lifecycle management of these components. So we decided we do a OEDA CLI, a, a command line interface to do things like adding and removing storage cells, adding and removing guests, databases, database homes. And we have all of that being run as part of the cloud service underneath the covers. And we also turned this on and said, you know, for on-prem customers as well, you have a lifecycle management utility. Now, the interesting part is if people got creative and with images that we did not expect, the level of combinations that are out there with clusterware and database are just a lot more exponential. And so we're slowly wrapping our heads around going, wait, we didn't know customer would have 42 virtual machines on a compute node. We thought our limit was eight, but all of a sudden you find a customer, a environment out there with 42 guests and we're scratching our heads going, wait, man, how, do you, how did you create that? So that's one of those things where the customer's gone off on their own because our best practice and our strong yeah. suggestion is a different <laughs> route. So the OEDA CLI has, has really come about and is really being pushed by the cloud team is what I'm getting from that. When you're talking cloud scale, everything becomes CLI, put it in a batch, put it in a script. Yeah. So without going into too much detail, all of those backend services are picking up and using OEDA, but from a CLI perspective. CLI perspective, yes, to do all yep. of lifecycle management. And all of that lifecycle management and all of that ability is also pushed into the OEDA that we see for the on-prem version of Exadata. It's the same OEDA, correct? Same OEDA, yep. So yeah, all of the operations are available. And funnily enough, all of us, Chandra, Rene, Phil, and I, all of us started out as DBAs and system admins in various past lives to where now we're sitting here going, yeah, we should just make all of this happen <laughs> with a uh, utility. So you get, no wonder your team calls go for so long. You've got like five DBAs and 10 opinions, yeah? That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I've just seen a question here. We saw OEDA as a directory in our Exadata server. All I know that we have to fill out OEDA questionnaire before install. How is this related to OEDA on the Exadata? So you have it to relate. Yeah, so if there's a directory on the server, it typically means ACS or whoever did the installation. Use that as a staging point to run the utility to install and configure the hosts for clusterware and database. So they've, they've taken the OEDA from a customer user perspective. You know, you've gone to the website, you've filled out the details. They've yeah. taken that with the bundle, the zip file that gets created and put that on the server. And that's what is being used to actually build the server build, and yes. build the environment. That is correct. There was another question about Exadata and XSCC over DOM0. So right now, they are on the InfiniBand network, so you will get Zendon use, you will get guests, and starting very soon, we will start having KVM guests as well. With, on XSCC? Yes, XSCC with yep. XSCC. Yep. Yes, so the, the KVM Zen thing is an InfiniBand versus Rocky thing. For the InfiniBand train, we continue with Zen. But Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the identical image. Doesn't matter if it's XCC or, or Exadata, it's actually same image, same yeah. OEDA. Same image, same OEDA, yes. Yeah. Identical, that's right. Same stick score, same features, okay. they go back everything, yes. So okay. how, how different is it to enforce the best practices on our dear colleagues who are managing XACC versus the traditional on-premises customers? 
Yes, yes, we work very closely with the XSCC team, very closely with the image that gets used and OEDA and the cloud tooling that goes on top of it to make all of that work as seamlessly as possible. So we work very closely with the recommended bundle patches of clusterware and database. So they run the monthly sustaining, get the latest security updates, and the layouts of the hosts themselves. And the clouded customer is an interesting hybrid because it's a combination of managed and unmanaged cloud in the sense that there are things that you're free to do on the compute nodes. And there is a utility and tooling that we provide to manage updates as well. And so there are things that you can do and things that when you do that kind of make it hard. If you, if you have a database home and you delete it just because you can, then it becomes hard to upgrade it. <laughs> you know all right i think we should um probably wrap up there with all right thank yes, you uh, we will have you guys back but we will force you to get on video so people can see you <laughs> all, right, all right thank you very much i'm saying this both to thank you and to give some context to the audience outside our organization we are especially grateful to you guys because you are very much in the line of fire for the operations and the delivery of our products. So we know that making time uninterrupted for all of you is very hard. Like I said at the beginning, this is a unique thing. Nobody else can talk about these topics with the authority and the understanding you have. It. We really appreciate that you make time from your real job. This has been great. We'll publish an edited version of this. Sure thing. Thank you. And thank you, Chris. And thank you, Gavin. We'll talk soon. I'll ping you on Slack. Thank you. <laughs> you close it today, Gavin. All right. Well, yeah. Thank you, everyone, for um, for joining us today. It's been a, a great talk with um, Chris and the team. As Chris mentioned, we'd like to get these guys back on. There's a, a lot of information to dig through. There's the, the whole life cycle piece and the, the patching piece, but also best practices. Also, um, just wanted to mention, if, if you have suggestions and enhancements, send me a message. I've been DMing with a, a few people about some enhancements, um, some suggestions. So bring them in. We'll see what we can do, and I'll, I'll hit Chris up for some, some enhancements from the field. Thank you very much for attending today. And yeah, we'll see you next time.